Let's say you get your first glimpse of this podcast in a clearing. You groove like a bird, lightly bobbing your head. And that's when the spoiler comes, not from the front, but from the sides. From the other three hosts, you didn't even know were there. Welcome to Diabolical, the show where four long-suffering friends dissect film's most dastardly schemes, then try to improve them. I'm your host, Adam, and this week's movie is the gigantic Jurassic Park. So, dear listeners, hold on to your butts and join us for an adventure 65 million years in the making. Let's get diabolical. Greetings and welcome to this week's pod. Joining me, as always, are my friends and fellow podcasters in the guise of the Panel of Peril. So, guys, please introduce yourselves and tell me if you could create a genetically engineered being or creature and turn it into a safari park. What would it or they be and what would you call your park? I'm Gaz. And my genetically engineered creature would be park dinosaur. Yeah. (laughs) So I'm thinking T-Rex, for example. Okay. T-Rex, but you'd cross it with Cenobites mm. from Clive Barker's Hellraiser. Ooh. So you'd have a T-Rex pinhead. Wow. So it'd have the pins on its head. It'd have its nipples torn <laughs> off. It'd have a long uh, black leather cloak. It'd have uh, spike chains at its every uh, <laughs> beck and call. And the site that it would be housed in would be called... Jurassic Barker. Oh, <laughs> nice. Do you know what? I love how your evil scientist brain is going to the effort of genetically modifying a non mammal to have nipples just so you can rip them off. I was thinking exactly the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> genetically engineer their nipples. You must engineer. That was going to be my question. I was going to say, I hate to embarrass you in front of all of your friends, but <laughs> dinosaurs aren't mammals. <laughs> Yeah, but as long as you genetically engineer them to have nipples, it's fine. Yeah. So what, what animal would you use to, to get the nipples in? You, I think you need to... Well, that'd be... What's the, what's, the, what's, the, what's, the, what's the animal with the biggest nipples in, in the mammal, mammal kin, kingdom? Probably like a uh, orangutan or something like that. Uh, it's Griff. <laughs> with, <laughs> Griff's got a one whale big noob, must be a good size. <laughs> Can't say I've ever seen a whale nip, but they must be massive. No, but whale, must, I, yeah, I'd say orangutans. Orangutan or a gorilla. You think an orangutan's got a bigger nipple than a blue whale, the biggest animal on earth? The blue whale, it says here. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, you'll have to include a picture of that in the show notes. Because <laughs> everyone wants to see a blue whale nip. Make sure you tag it, not safe for work. <laughs> There's nothing dirty about nipples, Craig. It's part of the beautiful majesty of life. <laughs> That's why I cut ho- holes in all my T-shirts. What's rude about a body? Tits. <laughs> <laughs> Our Lord Manly Supreme here, and I've always been a fan of the Loch Ness Monster. But rather than waste my precious life minutes on searching out like plesiosaur DNA, I'd genetically engineer a hybrid of a killer whale body with a giraffe's head and neck. Hmm. That way, it would always be near the surface for air, so we'd get to see it quite easily. <laughs> the, kind of, the silhouette would be very Loch Ness Monstery. Yeah. Uh, the park would be called... Come and have a look if you want. (laughs) (laughs) Craig here. As a proud Welshman and gourmand, I would want to genetically engineer giant prehistoric sheep. And in (laughs) honour of the first ever cloned sheep, uh, my park would be called Dollywood, which I don't think is currently the name of anything else. (laughs) Dollywood. I've just checked Google and that's original. (laughs) If I have to have an alternative name for it, I would call it Timothy Dalton Towers. Uh, Definitely nobody's uh, bagged that one, that's for sure. Oh no, I'm seeing here, it's the the name of the Timothy Dalton theme park. Okay, I can't have that. (laughs) It's got a roller coaster with his face on the front of it. Screaming. Ah! It's, a, it's a corkscrew. Spinning eyes and <laughs> teeth that are going up and down. Yeah. That like going making the organ sound. <laughs> Does his teeth go up and down? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and can you ride hobby horses with his face on it as well? 
course. A hobby sheep, though. <laughs> <laughs> Does he still man the merry-go-round uh, playing the live organ? <laughs> As for myself, I would create a genetically engineered version of celebrities that people aren't keen on, mixed with, like, dinosaurs. So I'd have, like, a herd of celebrities, small green celebrities, based on the compies from Jurassic Park 2, uh, like YouTubers and Instagram influencers like Logan Paul and that, just running around all together trying to get people's attention by squeaking and stuff like that and biting little bits out of them. Fighting heavyweight champions. Yeah, the ra- Raptors would be Raptors would be the Kardashians with Kim as blue. Clever girl. Piers Morgan <laughs> would be the Dilophosaurus, spitting venom and making a racket about anything he can that might get him attention. And uh, James Corden, the T-Rex. Say no more. Yeah. That's, <laughs> That's all we need to say about that. Just within instance of pod. <laughs> What's that. your part called? Uh, desperate and easy. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the surnames of the two founders? <laughs> when you said that, my mind, for some reason, jumped straight to Bill Owens, who I believe played Compo in Lust of Summer Wine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Loads of little compos. <laughs> Compies. <laughs> actually, now you said that, I would... Little I would, hats on. I, yeah. <laughs> Go <laughs> go down the hill in a in a bath. <laughs> Actually, I would I would now create a herd of them to fight with the other compies, the influencer compies, and then clash and see who'd come out on top. If anyone with any skills on Blender can get a thousand compos from Last of the Summer Wine to kill yeah. Peter Stormare, please do. Yeah. <laughs> or, or if you can just create a thousand compies as a picture with Bill Owen's face and a woolly hat on, that'd be great. So cheers. <laughs> they will of course be joining me at the end of the show where we will all compete for precious peril points to decide who will be crowned champion at the end of this series until then let's get stuck into the film Jurassic Park is the film adaptation of Michael Crichton's novel of the same name and was released in June of 1993 in the US. You probably don't need me to tell you that the film was a huge success, grossing approximately $1 billion at the box office, hailed by critics and audiences alike, becoming the new highest grossing film of all time, and going on to win three Oscars for Best Sound Effect Editing, Best Sound, and Best Visual Effects, all the while creating a legacy and franchise spanning almost 30 years. The film centres on industrialist John Hammond, who is building a safari resort off an island off the coast of Costa Rica. But, with a difference, he invites guests down to his resort, which include a worry lawyer, a sceptical mathematician, a paleontologist and a paleobotanist to evaluate his park for safety and if it is ready for the public, along with his grandkids. Ah, Little do they know that Hammond and his team of dedicated geneticists have resurrected dinosaurs, and, after his guest's arrival, they are quickly overwhelmed by the size of Hammond's achievement. Pun intended. Anyway, that's enough of that for now. Let's take a bite, wink wink, critically speaking, out of Jurassic Park. Craig, you said at the end of last week's show you've seen Jurassic Park 40 times, which is a bold statement, so I'm pretty sure... That's a good indicator of what you're going to say about this movie. I think 40 times is a conservative estimate, and you know how much I hate conservatives. <laughs> <laughs> Do you hate that estimate? <laughs> what can you say about Jurassic Park that hasn't already been said? But, I mean, personally, I would call it my favourite movie, or well, my favourite film, if you prefer, of all time. I'm not saying it's the best it's not artistically devoid of merit, but it is a popcorn blockbuster. But in terms of pure entertainment value, rewatchability, enjoyment, and, it, you know, there is a lot of skill, a lot of craft in there as well. It's my favourite film. I absolutely love it. Ah, I didn't realise it was your favourite film. That's, that's, um, sure it is. Is that, something you, you've, is that something you thought about this week? Or have you always gone, no, uh, if, if the chips are down... Oof, this is what you go to every time. Always has been, yeah. Desert Island disc of a film. For sure, yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, cool. Brilliant. I didn't know that. That was awesome. Gaz. I remember first seeing the trailers, or well, not even necessarily trailers, maybe pictures, when we were, what would we have been, 11, 12, yeah. when it came out. Yeah. And I just thought, this looks just ridiculous. Dinosaurs. <laughs> Dinosaurs in a park. <laughs> Are they taking the piss? Is Steven Spielberg taking the piss out of me? Does he honestly think I'm going to pay to watch this claptrap? <laughs> But I did. I paid to see it in the cinema. And yeah, I really enjoyed it. It's really cool. And uh, it continues to be a very good film to this day. And I'm a big fan of the uh, the whole series, apart from the last film that came out. <laughs> I remember when you were 10 or 11, Gaz, you were very, very cynical. But then I remember there was just a turn in your personality. Have we pinpointed it? <laughs> yeah, that, that might have been it. Ju- Jurassic Park. <laughs> Jurassic Park was the pivot point. Jurassic Park. <laughs> A life-changing film. I remember the trailer and being very excited about the idea behind it and I also remember queuing around literally the block to get into the cinema to see yes. it. Yes. In London, yeah. First yeah, time and, uh, yeah, and I was with my dad yeah. and my dad is not the kind of guy who queues around the block for things. So I was I was pretty grateful that uh, I got to do that. Yeah. yeah, it was a hell of a novelty seeing that all the way down mm. the street. Yeah. yeah, you don't see that anymore. No. Yeah. yeah. And there's something about being in that queue as well, the excitement, because everyone was buzzing. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. you didn't know whether you'd get in if you were quite far down the line. Yeah, because yeah, you couldn't book tickets in those days, could you? <laughs> no. no. And this yeah. was a, no, no, yeah, no. Properly this was a single screen cinema, <laughs> not a multiplex, and it only had you know so many showings a day. And this is like 1993, which is fairly modern, and we, we yeah. were, you know it's 30 years ago now, which is nuts, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. Is that what your memories are there, Lord Manley, as well, are they? Yeah, I remember queuing around the block and we all managed to get in. I'm pretty sure my younger brother was there, so he must have been like nine mm-hmm. on this watch through. I was surprised at, at how gory it is. Yeah. I was like, wow, yeah. I was quite young to watch this. Mm. And especially on, on Amazon here, it's rated 15, Jurassic mm. Park. Wow. But it, it, was, must have been, it must have been PG, PG at the time. At the time. It was, yeah. PG, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. So it'd been a while since, I, since I've watched it and so I, really, I really enjoyed it. Obviously, the nostalgia factor was pretty high. But what I really liked about it like, from a technical standpoint is it is filmed in kind of two halves. And the first half, we kind of experienced like the wonder of what it'd be like to see these immense creatures come back to life. And then it kind of descends into this just out and out horror. So you get these two disparate parts, which I thought was great. I thought it was peak Spielberg. And it's for me up there with Indy, Jaws, and E.T., which I think are his best. Yeah. I would um, echo everything you've all said, really. I remember first time I watched it, I remember ex- it wasn't in Llandino or, or Colm Bay or anywhere like that. It was when I was in holiday uh, in the summer down in mid-Wales and the excitement was palpable for me. I still remember queuing outside for a while, the big poster on the wall, just, and you know, seeing that as a kid, it's like, oh, dinosaurs. And you like, and you go in and you watch it and 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 again, it's like you just said, uh, Lord Manley is like it sets it up so beautifully that everybody is in it's shock and awe isn't it really it get you straight to this island and it, I think it they get to the island it's about 16 or 17 minutes in and it's like get there wow them and then everybody knows what's coming because we all saw like trailers and things like that but I remember at the time it yeah. was all the TV spots it was doing and it was all the Gallimimus right, yeah. thing where they're going Tim what's that yeah. oh Gala Gala Gallimimus and all that kind of stuff and it was that scene yeah. and I remember seeing that I was thinking there's got to be something that happens after that you know and, and then when I finally saw it it's like oh fucking hell this is so good yeah, it's, I'd say it's still in my definitely in my top ten, maybe in my top five. But I loved it, and I, I've I've da- I've I bought it on digital copy. I've got it on DVD at home. <laughs> so yeah, I'll never stop watching it. It was the first VHS that was mine. I remember that. Like uh, weirdly, got it from uh, Thresher's the off license, yeah. and wore it out. <laughs> Picked up a bottle of creme de mint. The Jurassic Park. <laughs> Don't insult my 11-year-old taste in liquor. I didn't know what I was doing. Creme de menthe was, was what I wanted. <laughs> you just thought it was liquid tree ball mints, didn't you? <laughs> oh, some of that. I wouldn't put it in my top 10, but uh, I did enjoy it. And I was never I was never a dinosaur kid. I was never like, oh, dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to the dinosaur kids. That, that was their famous line. All, 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 all in the, the corner of the classroom. Oh, dinosaurs. Oh, dinosaurs. <laughs> 
<laughs> what is it you like again, mate? Ah, oh, dinosaurs. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> One of my first notes is um, I'm falling in love with Laura Dern all over again. Yeah, that's one of my first ones as well. Except I've written, Laura Dern is magnetic. Yeah. I also watched some interviews with the cast at the time, and it was great. Laura Dern was saying about Dickie Attenborough or Richard Mm. Attenborough (laughs) when they were doing the ice cream scene, and they had to do it a few times, but... Dickie Attenborough was like, he, he made sure that he had li- lots of different types of flavours of ice cream, just in case, like, he was eating one ice cream, what, the same ice cream over and over again, and it put him off ice cream for the rest of his life. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, I got you, Richard! <laughs> <laughs> Which is quite a nice little bit well, of... I wouldn't uh, want to be put off ice cream for the rest of my life. Huh. Do you like ice cream, mummy? I like ice cream, mummy. Don't you like ice cream? He's huge fun in this as well. His performance is like brimming with with like mischief, and he yes. does the serious bits really well too. He, what I love is that he was Richard Attenborough; he was a big deal, right? A, a well respected actor. You know, mm. people probably best knew him for Brighton Rock, and he came into this having directed Gandhi and didn't really want to do acting anymore. And Spielberg kind of twisted his arm, and then he commits to it with both feet, and it's you can see that. And it is that a real saying? Commits to it with both feet. <laughs> He just coined it. Patent that. <laughs> Copyright that. <laughs> People will start saying it now. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to commit to something, you may as well do it with both feet. Yeah. I'm going to commit to that phrase. <laughs> I'm going to make it happen. Fly kicking. He committed to it with both feet. Good. Yeah, a drop kick. You have to commit to a drop kick, Gaz. You have all people yeah, should Gaz. that. Yeah. <laughs> but all the cast are so good. And Jeff Goldblum, especially, his style of acting is obviously yeah. quite idiosyncratic, but yes. it works really well in this. Yeah, is it his best movie? I'd say The Fly, personally. You think? Yeah, maybe. All I was going to say about Jeff Goldblum is it sort of kicked off a sort of brief run as like a proper marquee leading man. Yes. Independence yeah. Day. Independence yeah. Day, not yeah. after. Yeah. yeah. He, he was the, the main lead in The Lost World, yeah. the Jurassic Park sequel. Uh, and then he's just sort of gone back to, to mm. smaller, quirky mm-hmm. supporting yeah. roles. And a bizarre Disney Plus series where he answers <laughs> physics questions. Is yeah. that what it is? World according to Jeff he's, Johnson, He right? seems like he's, yeah. all the time, he seems like he's just enjoying himself all the time. And he's just yeah. like, mm. I think he's one of these guys who wakes up every day and just goes, oh, I'm so lucky. He just, he comes across yeah. that. All the interviews I've seen him with, and I follow him on Instagram as well and stuff like that. And he just seems so happy. And it's not like... He's trying to uh, promote himself too much. He just seems like he's just really, really, really pleased where he is. So more power to him. Yeah. Just going back to John Hammond, I think that story arc, seeing the film as an adult, and actually seeing how kind of wide eyed and excited he is to get everyone in this park and show everyone what he's created, and then how it all turns to shit and yeah. kind of culminates where you see him eating the ice cream. Mm-hmm. So yeah. sad. Yeah. Yeah. His desperation to, to keep the lie up as well. Like, yeah. Uh, Oh, yeah. we'll do it all right next time. And yeah, he was more sort of an overtly evil character. In the yes, book, yes, he, he? Yeah. was. And he dies. Oh, yeah. Too, yeah. And yeah, he dies at the end. Yeah, he he states the reason for doing it, and then the last reason he goes most importantly is about money, making lots of money. And then when when the grandkids get in danger, he goes, "I knew I shouldn't have brought those fucking kids." I was hoping to soften up Gennaro and stuff like that. And, and he's just a horrible bastard in it, really. There's elements of Hammond in, from the film in there as well, or vice versa or whatever. But he is, he's just a horrible bastard. So, yeah. He just yeah. wants to make shitloads of money and doesn't care. I think his characterization in the film is more interesting, personally. The film I mean, yeah. screen, the screenplay for the film is miles more interesting yeah. and um, the character development of all the characters is, is much better. The biggest thing I didn't like in the book is that Ian Malcolm dies, mm. which I felt like it was a, <laughs> I felt grieved by it because he he sort of from the whole way through he acts kind of self righteous, but he is for a for a bloody good reason. He's you know he, right. he gets it he gets it all right. Boy, do I hate being right all the time. <laughs> and then they talk about him slipping away, and then he and then they go, oh, what about Malcolm? And he goes, oh no, he didn't make it. And that's it, and he's gone. He doesn't. They don't give him a death scene or anything. I was like, fuck. He died off screen, sadly. Yeah. 
<laughs> is that why Jeff Goldman's character has this really interesting storyline right up until he's in the control room and then he just basically becomes a death? Yes. <laughs> yeah. well, he gets hit by the Rex in the, in the book as well as the, the, uh, as the movie. I think he does survive the book, though, doesn't he, retroactively? I think he is in the Lost World book and he's he? got more severe yeah, injuries. Is. Like, he can't walk properly. He's got a cane. Yeah, that that's the only one of the books that I actually read was The Lost right. World. And John Hammond's in it as well, and he's the film version of John uh. Hammond. It just doesn't explain it, doesn't <laughs> retcon it. It's just like, this is a sequel to the film, not to my own book. Right, yeah. <laughs> Michael Crichton's more of a concept guy. Do you know, by the way, um, what well-loved and long-running American TV series is based on Michael Crichton's life? Oh. ER? ER? Yes. Mm. Yeah. Dr. Carter is like the analog of Michael Crichton's medical career. He's a very clever wow. bloke. Spielberg got interested in this book before it was even published. And I think Crichton knew that it was that he wanted to turn it into a film. And straight away yeah. he was like, I want one and a half million dollars for the for the film rights. He got a very good cut. I don't know what percentage of the the gross he got, but he got a good cut of the gross. Yeah. And he got another five hundred thousand dollars for writing the screenplay, which also got rewritten again <laughs> by David Coop. So mm. he's a savvy businessman, if anything, you know, nothing, nothing else. Well, I think he knew what he had, and he'd already had a hit with Westworld, yeah. and this was just like mm. the pitch must have been so easy, like the elevator mm. pitch. It's Westworld with dinosaurs. Yeah. yeah, I want that. Yeah, let's see that. Especially Spielberg. Spielberg. I yeah, Spielberg was the mm. kid that I wasn't. Ooh, right. the dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's still sort of at the tail end of high concept filmmaking as yeah. well, yeah. aren't you? So, like Top Gun, Days of Thunder, all that sort of, um, freaks you called? Jerry Brookhart yeah. Yeah. style yeah. of filmmaking, and which I am a fan of, but obviously there's a lot more uh, depth and just more to it with a Spielberg film than, than that, that level, isn't there? Yeah. That level? What am I saying? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Just commit to it with two feet, guys, you'll be right. I went into this, obviously, with the mindset of what more can there be said about it, so I was kind of observing it with that mindset. One of the first things that I noticed is, do you find, although it's iconic, the typeface for Jurassic Park that appears on the Jeeps and the lunchbox and everything, when it appears in the credits, I, f I find it doesn't look right. It mm. looks cartoonish. And it doesn't fit the tone of the opening of the movie mm. where that guy gets fucked <laughs> eaten by the raptor it looks like the flintstones yeah i, I, I get what yeah. you mean yeah but then yeah. when you see it on those gates yeah. for the first time you, that's iconic mm. that's it works perfectly in every other aspect on the merchandise in on the jeeps mm. in the film but just in the credits i thought it could have done with uh you know raiders of the lost ark it just has that very simple font and then obviously the indiana jones font is hugely iconic mm. but they don't they kind of hold back from it and it just says Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I, I think Jurassic Park needed something like that, mm. personally. Mm. It's interesting, though, you mentioned like the merchandise and obviously the Jurassic Park logo and the, and the font and everything like that. And that itself is, you could say that's probably the most recognisable thing in the franchise, isn't it now? Because it's gone from Jurassic Park to yeah. Jurassic World. And then everything that appeared in the movie that was... Front was merchandise was also available in the real world, and I'm sure we've probably all mm. had Jurassic Park toys or Jurassic Park pencil case or lunchbox or whatever as well. Yeah. And you can just imagine, other than Star Wars up until that time, or well, maybe I'll, I'll say, oh, well, apart from Ghostbusters, probably mm. Star Wars, Ghostbusters, and Jurassic Park. Has there ever been the merchandise for for a movie? must be insane for Jurassic Park because it was everywhere, I remember. It was, yeah. My li my little boy inherited, we had a roaring T-Rex from Jurassic Park. My little lad, we, we emptied my mum's house a few years back and that was still in the attic and it was still working. So he got that. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I do remember one thing prior to that is I had the whole set, I had the lunchbox, the flask, I had trainers, oh, yeah. and a t-shirt and a belt <laughs> of the belt. of the no, not just belt <laughs> of the, um, the the French Connection too. That was the big merch movie before. <laughs> SCUK two, yeah. very good. <laughs> you briefly mentioned the opening scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
I've got something else to say about that when you're done as well. So don't don't move on from it. <laughs> and I just want to move on from that right now. Because... <laughs> <laughs> I think it really sets up the film. It's just a glimpse at where it's going to go. You know, you start off with this kind of quite harrowing scene, and then you go into this like wonderland that the awe of the, of the park and seeing these immense creatures mm. but at the back of your mind you know it something's yeah. got to go wrong because you've seen that first scene and that's that's like yeah. that's foreshadowing uh, I, I really thought it was great storytelling mm. yeah it encapsulates it really well because it's it's the same it's the illusion of control isn't it Muldoon mm-hmm. and his guys they act like this is routine and they've done it and they, you know not not um with contempt you know he's very serious about let's do this right but it looks like something they've done you know a hundred times and then with all even with all those checks and balances in place the raptor still outsmarts them and, and gets the guy what i was going to say about the opening is and this doesn't happen too often i can probably think of maybe one other time where it's been so jarring that i've noticed it but so a lot of john williams themes and they're all kind of you know iconic in their own way but they're all kind of it's kind of similar right they're like very uh mm-hmm. very strings horns oh yeah all that sort of kind of stuff percussion mm-hmm. you mean he's an orchestra yeah if you like <laughs> he uses strings <laughs> you know what, you know what i mean horns quite a bit percussion. Percussion. you know what i mean horns. <laughs> anyway at the start of jurassic park blockage bills there's this kind of heavy synth and it's more like triangle more like a john carpenter kind of it's got this doom 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 almost like a terminator opening kind of music uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Do you know what it sounds? It sounded like to me. It sounded like the start of Independence Day. I couldn't couldn't put a finger out of it at the time, but and I was like, you know, when the the, the Independence Day things are, appear on the screen, then they bust out, don't they? It was like the start of that. Don't remember it really. Have a look at the Independence Day uh, credits, mm-hmm. and it's like that. And it's like I was expecting the, the letters off the screen to move and stuff like that. It was giving me like Terminator, like John Carpenter synths, like doom 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 doom, and I, I just thought it was really cool. Since the connection between Jurassic Park and Independence Day is Jeff Goldblum, perhaps Jeff Goldblum actually composed that part and <laughs> had did. It in his contract. Yeah, that he based has to, on has to played. songs. He did actually. I've written that down. By as a fact. Jeff yeah. Goldblum. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's what it is. Yeah, <laughs> it's that dark place. That uh, Stephen. Uh, Stephen, I've had this idea for a, for, for a tune. <laughs> Goes like this. Um, uh, you, you've got, you got this tune and you've, you've, you've stamped it and you've slapped it on you've, you've, you've uh, obtained it without any. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> um, what you're saying about motifs and stuff? Then mm. I, when they're driving up in the in the jeeps up to the visitor center for the first time, I was like, "Fuck, that sounds like the motif he uses in Indiana yeah. Jones for the Nazis." Yeah. And it's like, yeah, okay. I'm not dissing him. Like, I'm glad that you found the word I was looking for before when you let me struggle with all the different types of music. <laughs> I just wanted to watch you squirm. <laughs> <laughs> it was glorious. <laughs> I couldn't remember it the other week, though. I I couldn't remember it for the when life of me. When you want the word, then, it's gone, when right? I was, when and then, you watch yeah, someone else. And then I was just I've got I've got I've got all my notes here when I was sitting watching a movie writing all the notes down. I was like, it's motif, yeah. Do, 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 do. There you go. <laughs> One of the reasons this film's held up really well, in terms of especially like the visual effects, is that they did a lot of work to ground them in reality as well. So you get these real locations mm. and they were doing things like shaking the real trees and you yeah. know, causing real effects on like the surfaces of water and things that really make those digital creatures feel and and obviously that probably helps that they were able to model the textures on the stan winston robots as well and all that together just really yeah. sells it for most for the most part i think it, it looks better and more believable than a lot of things that came after it yeah they wanted to do um stop motion didn't yeah. they and they, they tried the, the guy tried yeah it. Phil Tippett, wasn't it? Yeah. The guy at ILM who said, let's do it digital, wasn't allowed to do it. He went off and did it on his own and he brought it back to them Mm. just as a a proof of concept. And he was pretty close to getting fired. It was the T-Rex walk cycle. Yeah. It was that did it. Apparently they watched it. He he took it to Spielberg and he watched it with the stop motion guy. Mm. Phil Tippett. And he was like, And um, he watched it and he said, and he went, he went to the, he went to the stop motion guy, you're out of a job. 
and the stop motion guy went, don't you mean extinct? <laughs> nice. <laughs> and then Spielberg, apparently, folklore, kept it for the film, and that that's when he incorporated that. Yeah, I watched the, the documentary, which was just like interviewing the guy who did it, and I think that he did say that, so I think it probably is probably is true. Yeah. Gaz, do you want to add stuff? Well, my favourite sequence is um, the arrival on the uh, the open plane yeah. uh, in the jeep with um, our three main characters and just the, the camera being close up to them and they see the big leaf first and they're going crazy. And they're like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God, it's a fucking leaf. <laughs> he physically turns her head, doesn't he? It's really funny. Yeah. And then you get like the iconic pullback mm. with the glasses coming off, and the um, Diplodocus did that. It's, uh, yeah, a masterclass in um, building intrigue and uh, paying it off in a magical way. Yeah, it's that Spielberg magic, isn't it? Yes, and it, yeah, like like you say there, and the looks on their faces, and it's just that moment they're both blown away and you can tell and then Dickie Attenborough's there and he's beaming and then the whole bit about the T-Rex and stuff like that and then when they sit there and they're watching the dinosaurs coming out of the pool and oh they're moving herds and they're just beaming and they're just they do moving herds yeah how did you do this I'll show you yeah <laughs> it's great is that the most magical Spielberg minute moment I don't know E.T. flying over across the moon E.T. yeah I'd say it's probably the most awe inspiring Spielberg moment if not the most magical they managed to nail the scale, didn't they? Yeah. That was key. They made it look like these humans were tiny in this world. Shooting them from below. Yeah, brilliant. There's another bit that after that encapsulates the same kind of wonder and joy and and just pure emotion is when they meet the Triceratops. Yeah. With the sick Triceratops and they're, they're crying. Yeah. And they're like, and then and Sam Neill's, uh, as Grant is getting lifted up and down with the uh, with the chest movements of the thing and that was the first one of the first scenes they shot as well so it must have been overwhelming and to see these like special effects and the f- full life size yeah. yeah the quality of that animatronic i reckon made it very easy to act with yeah because you can see the wonder on sam neil's face it's just genuine yeah he's like wow this is awesome yeah imagine what it'd be like for the kids you know yeah the, the kids on et thought et was real so imagine being the kids on jurassic park and getting to be by this mm-hmm. all day amazing animatronic not just the triceratops you know the t-rex set piece one of the best set pieces ever filmed and they probably didn't enjoy it that much because you know it was a malfunctioning robot that was crashing down on them <laughs> but apart from yeah. that <laughs> you know the story about tim and lex the the roles are switched because in the book he's tim's the older one and lex is the a younger annoying sister right and they swap. That was done by Spielberg because he met Joseph Mazzello yeah. before and he wanted, well, he wanted him for Hook. He auditioned for Hook, but he said, no, you're too young. Uh, Way too young. Who, you. who did it in the end? Dustin Hoffman, yeah. wasn't it? Way too young. <laughs> <laughs> ah, oh, you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he, he, it was a, a Kihi Juan thing, mm. again, saying like, we've got to work on a movie. And he put him in Jurassic Park and swapped the roles around. Did you see he played John Deacon in Bohemian Rhapsody? Really quite convincing. Yeah, I, I was looking, funny enough, I was looking at his filmography to say what, see what he'd been in since then. And he's had quite a, a mixed career, really, yeah. to say the least. Yeah. So he's done, done all right, hasn't he? So A uh, little bit of trivia for you. Trivial alert. Throughout Jurassic Park, Spielberg replaced, you know, usually, typically a director would say action and then they'd start the scene. But for this, Spielberg replaced it with, shoot her, shoot her. <laughs> That's how they start every scene. <laughs> That's got to be bollocks. <laughs> yeah, it is. I like it. A good one. <laughs> I would like to give um, a big shout out to Bob Peck as well, because I think um, what he does with Muldoon is unbelievable. And he's, he's, he's my favourite character in it for screen time. Because he's just the, the way they focus on him on certain points and the, the lines he says and the way he delivers them. It's like he knocks it out of the park. I've fucked every animal you can fuck, but these things can't fuck them. <laughs> yeah, I tried. I've tried, but I couldn't. <laughs> Quiet, all of you. They're approaching the yeah, that's panic. Brilliant. <laughs> that's it, yeah. Turner, here's a question for you about Muldoon. Yeah. Shorts, inappropriate, appropriate for a man no. of his age? No, no, he's um, 
uh, I I did the math on um, Bob Peck, how old he was at the time. He was 47. So I intend to still be wearing shorts at 47. But ride up that high? I mean, cool. hiring you, he must have been in danger of revealing a bollock. He must have been. Uh, no, only if the netting that held his testicles in had perished. <laughs> do you get netting in, uh, in khaki shorts? I don't know. You do where I shop. You'll have to give me that number. <laughs> I'll put you in touch with Giovanni. <laughs> One thing I really love about um, Dickie Amber's performance in this is the times he corrects himself on the English to American pronunciations of things like uh, car- car- carousel. <laughs> and I can get back on schedule. Uh, uh, schedule. I just think that's yeah. great. It's a nice, just a nice little bit of business, little touch. He's just, he's just fantastic throughout anyway, isn't he, really? I've got a few questions I'd like answered, if you don't mind. Ooh, Are they to do with Jurassic Park? Or? Uh, there's a few. It's a, a, a broad spectrum of questions. Number one, we talked about the merchandising earlier, but how much did you want a pair of Jurassic Park night vision goggles? Oh, yeah. Holy fuck. More than anything in my life. Mm. They yeah. are the bee's knees. Bob Peck's knees. Not just because they're cool night vision goggles, but because the like the colour and size and everything of them, I always thought was really cool as well. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, it's the light on the front, the green light. Is that a no from you, Gaz? I don't really remember them. I'm sure I will have at the time, but I, I have no recall of it. Didn't watch it this week then, no? Oh, actual in the film. I thought you meant <laughs> this is an actual toy that got released. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Go, 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 go. Uh, no, not really. <laughs> So when Gaz started getting into metal, especially Meatloaf, so what he probably wanted was a, a severed goat's leg. <laughs> a, uh, a frilly white shirt with a cravat. <laughs> Didn't your dad offer you the option as well? He goes, no, sorry, would you like, would you like night, Jurassic Park night vision goggles or this frilly shirt? A frilly shirt with a cravat. I'll take the frilly shirt, please, Dad. The cravat, the cravat. <laughs> Snapped his hand off. <laughs> Not a dry eye in the house. Oh. Next question. Yo. How did Jeff Goldblum's shirt open? He opened it. Through animal magnetism. Next part of this question. Why didn't it close for the rest of the film? All the buttons had popped off. <laughs> you couldn't contain it. I think it was sweat that did it. Sweat slipped them open and then sweat made it impossible to close it. Uh, uh, these buttons are uh, just too slick to go back in the hole. It's the essence of chaos. <laughs> <laughs> i got a couple of questions for you. The first one is, couldn't Tim have easily fit through the gaps in the electric fence instead of climbing over it. Yeah, I thought exactly the same thing. No, no, no. Yeah, Grant can't. Grant tries, but Tim... Yeah, but it, it didn't, he wouldn't even get his head through it, Alan Grant. He does get Tim, his head through it, and then he decides he can't get his shoulders through it. Doesn't, it. He, he sort of goes like that and goes to try and get his head, but he realises he's not going to get There's through There's definitely it. A, a gap he can get through. Yeah, typically I'd say butter up the kid and force him through. Right. But I think even without the presence of butter, you could have got him through there. Yeah. But you're making him more um, tempting for the T-Rex of buttering him up. Rub Jeff Goldblum over him. Just grab a bit of slick sweat from Jeff Goldblum's chest. Yeah, that's it. Gre- you go. Grease up Tim and slide uh, him through. What the hell are you doing, Tim? Here's some grease. I've got butter in the in the cafeteria. I've spent no expense. <laughs> I would like to make another official entry into the Craig Morris Memorial 80s and 90s leading men who don't get on with technology hall of fame sam neil ladies and gentlemen sam neil dr yeah. alan grant <laughs> tying his seat belt he's up there now with with bruce willis is uh yeah john mcclay <laughs> yeah well we'll go for favorite sequences favorite sequences then we'll do favorite lines so um who wants to start me off what about here what about here i don't think you get any better than the t-rex chase scene it's fucking unbelievable. What, this, the Jeep? Yeah, yeah. Terrifying. It's shot so well. Christ, it's amazing. And then at the end of it is uh, Muldoon does a little, like that when he when he knows he's got away. And he just goes, mm. <laughs> <laughs> And I've actually written down that as well. I put Muldoon's uh, little smile after they get away from the wrecks. <laughs> My favourite scene is the sea bass dinner debate that they have. Just fucking brilliant. You know, when they talk about... you. Pen, it, your package, it's just like all that, that whole scene from beginning to end is perfect. I absolutely love it. Yeah, great. 
Girls. Aside from the sequence that I mentioned earlier, I do actually quite like the sequence when they first get to the lab on the little ride with Mr. DNA. It's a big exposition info dump, but it's done yeah. in such a fun way. The only other film that I can think of that, that does such a massive info dump in an entertaining way is The Matrix. Yeah. It's never boring no. and you understand everything yeah. by the end of it yeah. it's, it's not confusing it's well well laid out yeah very good economical storytelling it is fantastic it's a perfect vehicle for it isn't it mm. should have done that in the matrix they split off Lawrence fishburne and he's like hello morpheus hello morpheus they could have in resurrections couldn't they yeah Wow. <laughs> ball bearing Morpheus. <laughs> For me, it's when um, Alan Grant finds out they've bred raptors, and is that's. For me, that point where he goes, what species is this? And he's holding a little baby raptor. Mm. And they say, oh, it's, we've bred raptors. And then he's standing outside the raptor pen with his hands on his hips, looking up, going, oh, shit. Yeah. I love that little bit there. And then, you know, they feed him and him talking to Muldoon at the same time. It's, oh, it's great. I love that bit. Yeah. Favourite lines then, Chaparino's. I mean, obviously, there are, there are a ton of, like, really obvious ones. So I've gone for a couple that I think are less obvious. One is on on the Mr. DNA ride when the lawyer Gennaro asks, "Are these characters auto erotica?" <laughs> I've got that written. I loved it. I'd never noticed it before. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't the actor who played uh, Gennaro uh, an absolute nutcase, and he was like campaigning to become the main character, <laughs> <laughs> to not not be killed off on the toilet? Wow. Like, Jeff Goldblum tells amazing stories about him. <laughs> Craig, you actually introduced me to my favourite line yeah. from Jurassic Park. Yeah. Yeah, of course, I know what you're going to say. And it's, uh, see, the Tyrannosaur doesn't obey any set patterns or park schedules. <laughs> the essence of chaos. Yeah. <laughs> Slaps his knees. And it was the Craig slap his knees, made me laugh my head off. And it, since then, it's always been my favourite line in that movie. Yeah, I love <laughs> his physical performance. I love the bit when he's talking to Sattler and he grabs a bit of her hair. I live on, on the helicopter at the start when he puts his hand on uh, Hammond's lap and he's like, get off. <laughs> and that's that weird laugh that he does. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, go, on. go on then, Gaz. Give us your favourite lines. Uh, I've got God creates dinosaurs. God destroys dinosaurs. God creates man. Man destroys God. Man creates dinosaurs. And then... Dinosaurs eat man, woman inherits the earth. It's a nice little uh, sort of um, screwball zinger. Yeah. I also love the framing of that and then uh, how slack jawed Malcolm is. And, and then you've got Grant in the background just grinning. He's really proud of her. <laughs> Their relationship's quite weird, I think. It's a romantic relationship, isn't it? But yeah. to me, they all. Yeah. They, yeah, they could also be. Father, daughter, or brother, sister, as well. It's it's very weird. Yeah, <laughs> but I think that's cool, and that's why it doesn't work out. Mm. There's a twenty year age gap between them, and that's be just between Sam Neill uh, and Laura Dern. In at the time, she's twenty five and he's forty five. Well, she like fossils, isn't she? Yeah, uh, old and grey, <laughs> drier the better. She was twenty five. Twenty five in nineteen ninety three. Are you sure? She's fifty five now. Yeah, that's according to Wikipedia. Anyway, wow. Well. Don't blame me, blame Jimmy Wales, all right. I always do. <laughs> My favourite line is, uh, no, we can't. Why? Because we're being hunted. <laughs> it's all right. Love it. Run. I've got, I've got it. her. <laughs> John Hammond says, spared no expense quite frequently in the movie. Which one do you think is the best spared no expense? When they're eating the ice cream. Got to be. Yeah, you're right. Craig got the right answer there, so anything you were going to say is wrong. <laughs> Disgruntled Jurassic Park contractor Dennis Nedry makes a deal with rival genetics company to steal embryos to help them catch up on InGen's research. Aiming to deliver the embryos stored in a cleverly designed shaving foam canister to the East Dock where a courier awaits. As the person who has written the code for the park systems, Dennis Nedry is ideally placed to temporarily crash security systems so he can gain access to the cold storage of the embryos. 
Nedry takes a gas-powered jeep with the intention of making the drop off at the dock and returning to the control room without too much fuss. Lord Manly Supreme, what did you make of the plan? Well, it's a plan of two halves, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's this genius coding and then this ridiculous escape attempt. I have no idea how or why he drove into the East Dock sign. <laughs> glasses were fogged up, weren't they? He was going too fast and he was uh, glasses steamed up. He practised it and got there in 18 minutes. So he should know the way without hitting the bloody sign? Well, that's true. Yeah. The guy tells me he's going to go 15 minutes, mm-hmm. so he's going faster. But it still seemed a little bit of a bumbled attempt, especially if he'd rehearsed it. Maybe he's not done it in the dark before. Mm-hmm. So for the quality of the programming, you get some some florets. <laughs> but for the quality of his uh, his escape, his execution of his escape, he loses some florets. Ooh. So he winds up on about six florets okay. of broccoli. Okay. So substandard by anybody's uh, rating system. It's not the low below, but... No, it's not the lowest low, but it's for, you know, for somebody who's a, a, an expert in his field, it should be better. He's not a scapologist. He's not Harry Houdini, for example. Yeah, but he's not being dunked in a vat of water and uh, you know tied up with a um, straight jacket, is he? I don't want to preempt any mistakes you might have made in your plan, by the way, but he, he's not trying to escape, you realise, as Turn said in his intro. Yeah. He's just delivering the... Uh, he just goes down and he yeah, comes back up. Yeah, all right, well... Delivering. Yeah, okay, good. Gaz? Yeah, it, it's the it's the driving that lets him down, isn't it? He's, he's like a little bloody boy racer. A little a little fat, sweaty, <laughs> goggle-eyed boy racer. <laughs> wiping his flabby face as he careens through the jungle, <laughs> smashing hither, thither and jither. <laughs> he would have gotten away with it if, if he'd have just... Had a couple more driving lessons, is my opinion. Like the the advanced driving course after you pass your test, if he'd have just done that, I reckon he would have been fine. Hmm. Well, maybe it'll feature in one of our plans. He's let himself down. No, nobody else has caused his downfall. He's done it to himself. He's let himself down? Yeah. He's let his employer down and he's let his mum down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I got to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> The unforeseen storm and the knock-on effect that has on how much time he has to to execute his plan goes against him. Apart from that, I think it's a pretty solid plan and may have gotten away with it if everything, if the circumstances were optimal. Mm. But if the, if there's one bad thing about his plan, it's that he didn't obviously properly test the code they did because he didn't mean to turn off all the fences that he did. It didn't go quite right. Mm. Also. The fact that Arnold is then able to go over to his workstation and kind of see that the the way that the code worked in sequence to shut down things, he probably could have worked out that he was trying to access the lab and, mm. and then going from somewhere. Maybe they would have investigated the lab at that point. Who knows? Would he have got away with it if he'd come back? It's hard to say. It's two-pronged, isn't it? Because he didn't mean for it to be so catastrophic and then obviously he gets eaten. Not ideal. Yeah, uh, not optimal to get eaten. It's hard to say if it was in his plan. Unless you're a cheeseburger. <laughs> yeah. There's not many cheeseburgers driving Jeeps around these days, is there? Not as many as there used to be in 1993. <laughs> no. Not, n- no cheeseburgers designing any computer systems these days and driving Jeeps. I'll tell you that for nothing. So friggin' uh, Subway sandwiches these days, isn't it? Can we just be clear that we're not comparing Wayne Knight to a cheeseburger? <laughs> I think he's a very talented actor. <laughs> yeah, he is great. Yeah. Don't forget, he's yeah, in great. fucking yeah. JFK, isn't he? And, uh, yeah, Basic Instinct. Basic Instinct, yeah. Basic Instinct, looking at Sharon Stone's muff. <laughs> <laughs> Nedry's well-conceived plan quickly comes undone as he crashes his jeep, first knocking down a sign directing him to the east dock, and secondly down an embankment where he loses his glasses and eventually meets his end at the fangs of a Dilophosaurus. But can we do any better? I shall uh, go first with my plan. (gasps) Uncouth. (laughs) Hold on to your butts! If only Dennis Nedry had bought contacts and not glasses, he wouldn't have crashed. No steaming up there. He would have made it to dock and escaped with the embryos. Simple, really. <laughs> is, that, is that the end? <laughs> no. <laughs> I was I was hoping you would think you might, yeah. <laughs> Just give him, get contacts all sorted. Then, no. Despite Nedry doing a dry run, as he mentions in the film, he doesn't know his way to the dock off by heart. Nedry has seemingly forgotten something 
that all good theme parks and safari parks have, which is a map given out to visitors as they arrive. Oh. Jurassic Park is no exception. In fact, Hammond has even laminated his maps, spared no expense. Yes, all Nedry needs to do is pop to the visitor centre and pick up one of the handy maps just in the off chance he loses his way and needs a guide. Studying the map before he makes his run also helps him get it straight in his mind. So he lets Hammond know he's off to get some snacks from the vending machines. After he's stolen the embryos, Nedry heads to the garage as usual where he picks up a jeep. As the weather has made a turn for the worse, he also grabs some night vision goggles and a big taser with him, just in case he runs into any unforeseen circumstances, of course. All the rooms that were secure are now opened, which makes gathering all these extra implements possible. With his trusty map on his passenger seat and feeling safe and secure with the extra equipment, Nedry makes the rendezvous in the nick of time and then head back to the control room without further incident. Without further incident. When questioned about where he's been and why he's wet, he explains that all the junk food he's been eating all day gave him the trots and that he went to the toilet in the garage to do a poo so that the smell didn't bother anybody in the control room. He also explains that the taps have a particularly strong pressure and that they sprayed water all over him when trying to wash his hands and he has spent some time, unsuccessfully, trying to dry himself and was unaware of the problems facing the park. Sick of his constant yammering, and kind of glad that he hasn't had to smell any of Med <laughs> Nedry's monster turd, Hammond is more concerned about the crisis that is looming, and orders him back to his computer terminal to get Jurassic Park back online, which he manages to do, just about. The next day, when the storm has settled down, and everyone is back, safe and sound, Nedry catches the next boat to the mainland, and to collect the rest of his money. Do you know what? Just so happens that today, while I was trying to think of inspiration for my plan, I came across this article that I'm sending you via WhatsApp now that explains why the park map for Jurassic Park is full of errors. Oh, that's a shame. I've got that, so sorry. Evidence insubmissible. Nonetheless. I wasn't basing it on any of... The maps that are available in the, the, this map was available in my scheme. Oh, so in your scheme, you had to become a cartographer and create your own map of Isla Nublar before you went into this plan. No, I'm saying that in my scheme, the Jurassic Park is where Hammond has spared no expense, has created a wonderful map, which is even laminated, spared no expense, and Nedry uses it as part of my plan to help him to remember where to go. Right, but what I'm saying is the map in the movie that is in the, in the movie that we're doing. It's full of errors. Yeah, but I mean, that's just that's just nerdy. In the real world of the film, they'd have made the correct map, right? But that's not the problem. And this is a problem maybe with the, the film, a large problem with the film. If he was going back mm. rather than escaping, how would he explain the, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, you didn't say the magic word, and all that weird coding that sent stuff down? He gets back before all that bullshit. As they realise he's not coming back, then that's when they go onto his desk and start trying to, to access all the codes. And then they're looking at his keystrokes to find out what he's done. That's right. Ah, uh, okay. Fair enough. Then that's my curiosity satisfied. Boom. One other thing that I've uh, mm -hmm. quickly looked up is that contact lenses fog up. Do they? Oh, yeah. well, I'm glad I didn't use that as a plan. Good. Um, I, I was like, that was my main thing for a couple of days. But then I was like, no. Does it not just um, fog when you blink? No, apparently not. <laughs> I don't know. I've never had contact lenses. I tried them once and I couldn't get them out, so ne never tried them <laughs> so again. So they're still in now. <laughs> <laughs> still there, floating around somewhere. Yeah. No, it took me literally 35 minutes to get them out because you've got to pinch them to pull them off your eye. Oh, I know. Oh, I God. don't fancy doing that at all. You know that I've got, like, Nesta Carbonell eyelashes and I find it really difficult to get my fingers <laughs> past them anyway. But, um, yeah, it was so difficult. I just thought, I can't do this every day. So, never bothered again. <laughs> I like the idea of using the night vision goggles, so very clever. Yeah. just It was just like an extra insurance policy, just in case. Yeah, it makes sense. And then with all with the, all the access and stuff, everything that he, he's he's dis disabled, everything, it's like, why not take extra stuff and not just... Because he's very 
carefree considering the circumstances as well, you know, with the extra variable of the bloody hurricane or storm, whatever is going on. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't make any sense. There we go. Any further questions? None from myself. Bon. Uh, Who would like to go next? I can. You have to choose. Then I will choose Lord Manly Supreme, seeing as he's uh, volunteered himself just then. That was a funny decision. I'm ducking a point of you for making it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Nedry is more than just an anagram of nerdy. He is a capable programmer who gets a lot right. He shuts down security and gets his greasy mitts on the embryos. The only part he botches is his delivery and exit strategy. So that's where I focus my efforts. In the weeks leading up to the heist, I send a message to Dodgson with instructions detailing how we'll extract the specimens. It costs a little more than a boat, but compared to the money he'll make from the merchandise, it's chump change. I then begin my personal preparations. I slowly, incrementally start to increase my visits to the toilet. (laughs) Hammond (laughs) thinks little of it. The amount of snacks I consume, it's a wonder I'm off the toilet at all. But each time I visit, I secretly stash a toilet roll or two about my person and smuggle them back to my room. They're double quilted. Hammond really did spare no expense. (laughs) On one of my breaks, I innocently announce that I need some fresh air. If the embryos are going up your ass, I'm just going to remind you that this is my plan that I told you last week that you would do. (laughs) I can't believe you ruined that for me. I really wanted to keister these bad boys. I just like the fact that two of our plans have involved using the toilet as an excuse so far. I couldn't believe it when you said that. I couldn't believe it. I'm just wondering if we're going to make it three for three, then four for four. (laughs) On one of my breaks, I innocently announce that I need some fresh air. I wander down to maintenance where I strike up a conversation with a fellow working class Joe. Here, buddy, warm out today. Have a soda. Any chance I can grab a little of that fencing wire? A guy needs somewhere to hang his laundry, am I right? (laughs) We both laugh like maniacs as he cuts me a lengthy length of wire. Having procured the items I need, I spend my evenings crafting an important piece of the puzzle. Weeks later, during my meeting with Dodgson, he hands me the shaving foam can, the money, and another large case. We confirm that everything is in place and agree that it will go down before sunset the following day. Visibility will be crucial. Back on the island at the agreed time, I run my program and make my snack-related excuses, then leave the control room. I collect the samples, as in the film, then I get back to my room. Everything is laid out ready, including the item I crafted earlier. I put on the full suit of double-quilted armour and helmet, and adjust the extra rolls around my neck. I look like a sordid love child of a mummy and the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. (laughs) but it fits snugly and I feel safe. I grab the large case, then head to the roof. Once up there, I look at the sky. I see clouds in the distance. Looks like a storm's approaching. Good job I decided to do this before sunset. I hear the rough growl of a Boeing B-17. Bingo. I open up the large case and connect the lift line inside to the harness I'm wearing beneath my protective shell. Then I rip the cord activating the self-inflating balloon sending the lift line skyward. (laughs) The B-17's V-shaped yoke engages the line and I'm lifted off the ground at breakneck speed. My head snaps back, but the double-quilted neck protector is more than up to the job. (laughs) It feels like falling gently into a meadow of pillows made of jello and goose liver. (laughs) I cackle uncontrollably as they reel me in. One of the extraction team pulls me aboard the plane. I stop laughing just long enough to say, Hey, do you think they saw us? (laughs) Jesus Christ. The one minor flaw and one major flaw. The one minor flaw is that this plan takes weeks to put into effect and his meeting with Dodgson is the weekend before that week of work. He didn't make the heist on the day, did he? But that's fine. You could have thought of it before then. That's fine. That's fine. There's a bigger problem. Big, the biggest problem? There's a huge problem and it's much bigger. It's, it stinks more than Dennis Nedry's massive turds as well. Oh, yeah. Much more. The reason Nedry executes his program when he does is that's when Wu and the other technicians leave the lab and the cryostasis room so he can go in and steal the embryos. That's why he's got that window. He tells Dodgson, I've got an 18-minute window, and that's the window he means, is when Wu leaves for the boat 
to go home for the weekend. You can't do it in the day. Oh, uh, no, but it's, they've gone for a fag break there. Oh, have they? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How do you get them to all go for a fag break at the same time? Oh, scientists famously flock together. Much like, <laughs> like birds. <laughs> <laughs> Evading a predator. They, they move in herds. <laughs> You've missed the biggest, bigger issue than that. Was it bigger? Way bigger. It's in the middle of a storm. What happens to toilet paper when it gets wet? It's not in the middle of a storm. He does it before sunset. The storm doesn't hit before sunset. It's, it hits at night. Nevertheless, you know a lot about uh, aviation, Turner. Is a Boeing going to fly into that storm, to the island? It's not a storm. That's what I'm saying. It's before the storm. The storm still <laughs> exists. It's on the ocean. And the Boeing would have to fly through it to get to the island. The storm... It comes from the other way. <laughs> not, not necessarily, because it, it could be coming from a different direction. Well, in which case, it would have to fly into the storm on the way out. That's why Nedry looks up. <laughs> he looks up and goes, oh, there's a storm approaching. But the Boeing's coming from a different direction. So they pick him up, and then it turns. And he goes, hey, I can see storm clouds in the distance, plane. Talking into his, mic, his watch mic. <laughs> you better go the other direction. <laughs> The plane can see it. The plane looks at the weather before it flies. Why has he fashioned a, a suit and a coat hanger type appliance to get picked up himself? <laughs> Why hasn't he just got Dodgson to provide one? No, because break, breakneck speed. Breakneck speed. Double quilted. <laughs> or better yet, put the TP put the TP and coat hangers around the uh, barbasol can and let the plane take that instead of him. And he just goes back in. Oh, yeah. No, because he has to get off the island. He's not going to be able to ex- explain all that. I think he, he has to get off the island. That's his big mistake. That's not part of his plan. Delivering though. the can is not enough. He's going to get caught easily. Mm. Mm. I don't buy them all going for a fag break at the same time. But they do. But smokers do. Smokers do all go for a fag break at the same time. But that relies they? on every scientist in that lab being a smoker. And these scientists are all, they're all heavy drinkers and smokers. <laughs> that's, why John, that's why John hired them. He likes scientists who can have a laugh. <laughs> Like David Brent, is he? <laughs> Hammond. <laughs> Scientists who can have a laugh. A, have to smoke. B, have to drink. Heavily. <laughs> <laughs> <Emily. laughs> and C, all smoke at the same time. Okay. I like it. Charmin Skyhook, I'm calling that. that plan. <laughs> oh, Gaz, do you want to add anything to musings on Will Manley's uh, plan? That's a shake of the head. That's a, <laughs> is that a shake of the head? Is like... Do I have to, do I have to say anything about that plan? Is that a shake of the head? Gaz has forgotten we're on yeah. radio. That's no, it's 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 a more that was a flawless plan, shake of the head, and all all the things that you guys have picked out out, out of it as bullshit. So that was what that shake of the head meant. It was loaded. No, it wasn't. That shake of the head was your son returning to your house being dropped off by the police. Shake of the head. Oh shit. Yeah, that's how serious we are here. Really fucking serious, Craig. Anybody want a soda or something? I waffle something to my colleagues about getting something salty from the vending machine. They all think I'm just a flake, but I'm as cold as ice. Cream of the crop. They should take me up on my offer. If there's one story I have the scoop on, it's the snack situation on Isla Nublar. I'll return with a feast. Uh, I thought I should tell you that the system is going to be compiling for about... 15 to 20 minutes, so some of the minor systems might go on and off, but it's just nothing to worry about. It's just, it's just a simple thing. I synchronize my watch and click my mouse, executing my program. This is my magnum opus. I've got this down to 18 minutes on my practice runs. Still, this storm is an unknown variable that could cause a ripple effect, and my buddy at the dock can only hold the boat for 15 minutes. I need to do this now. I've seen what you're doing. Well, you do. You've picked up on it. I need to do this now while Wu and the others are out of the lab and waiting to float home. (laughs) This will be my only chance to grab the embryos without leaving a trace. But the rest of the timeline? That's all Dodgson. His screwball Barbasol can will only keep the embryos (laughs) cool for 36 hours. Otherwise, I could get this guy back here on the next boat that drops the staff back at the island. As I sidestep the security camera's cone of vision, I realise I actually do want a snack. For all the cheap-ass Hammond is, his irritating mantra, spared no expense, is definitely true when it comes to the food. Damn, we even have our own special geological era-themed Ben and Jerry's. Eaton Mesozoic, Pecan Pistocene, <laughs> Neolithican, that's when it hits me. I'll hide the embryos in the ice cream. That way... 
they can stay in deep freeze as long as I need. Then I'll just casually run that down to the dock after the weekend and hand the whole crate over to Dodgson's guy. I don't want my batch to get mixed in with the rest, so I'll print out a bespoke label I can identify. It needs to be convincing. What shall I call my flavour? Tyrazinosaurus rum? Candy Flossoraptor? Triceratoc? Gallimimus? <laughs> Damn. They're too believable. They all sound delicious. I don't want Hammond's grandkids breaking open a tub of Biscophosaurus and finding my nest egg. I need to make the names sound believable, but also a little bit gourmet and gross sounding. Rich people food. Giraffe's Dick Park? Try ass lick period? That's probably too much. In the end, I slap my sticker over my personal crate of crustaceous period trilo cookie dough bites, lobster flavour ice cream, and bury it, along with the embryos concealed within, under some more appealing sounding frozen treats, before grabbing some snacks and making my way back to the control room. I arrive just in time to see Arnold sweeping my desk. By now, they see the fences are down. I'd be driving through them by now. Hammond, Arnold and Muldoon are screaming insults at me. Contrite but defensive, I quickly halt the program and restore the fences, narrowly averting disaster. The tour group reports the Rex has approached the fence and got a nasty shock. Hammond and the others are irritated but mainly relieved. He tells me we'll talk Monday. I fully expect to be fired and sent home. Fab. <laughs> I am very disappointed that... You didn't have... Well, you didn't stop fucking sighing all the way through, as usual. (laughs) 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 Why is Craig speaking? Yeah, that is annoying. (laughs) Craig speaking. Go on, what are you disappointed by? You you didn't involve any toilet business in it, (laughs) which is... After after getting back to my desk, I shit all over the place, (laughs) like Cartman. (laughs) Uh, can I vote now? <laughs> Come on. Uh, the only thing I would I would have said that you should have done was um, instead of labelling it as ice cream, you should have just put on the box Dennis Nedry stool sample and just put it in the freezer. <laughs> imagine, can you just imagine Hammond finding it and being like, what's he put this in here for? <laughs> That's what I mean. I can just imagine the whole scenario. I just would have been pissing myself. That's my only notes for that. Yeah. Once I had the idea of putting in the ice cream, I couldn't stop thinking about stupid Ben and Jerry's names for ice cream. So I just thought I'd have a bit of fun with that. Yeah. But I did enjoy some of those names, though, yes. Are the embryos pushed into ice cream or are they just put into an empty tub? Just into, you know, like ice cream comes in crates of like six tubs. Yeah. So you put them like between the tubs inside the plastic packaging and then put the label over the other label. So fine. That's fine. My only issue with this, and I never thought my experience as a Iceland (laughs) as a staff member of the supermarket Iceland would come in handy here. But you know what? (laughs) What uh, what temperature freezers usually operate? Yeah, like? I have been in freezers in various supermarkets, yes. Minus 18, is it? That sounds about right. Usually 18 to 20, around that mark, yeah, yeah minus 18 yeah. to 20. Do you know what temperature DNA is stored at? No. Typically minus 80. Ooh. You can do minus 20 for a shorter time, but it will last about as long as the, the uh, shaving foam can. Oh, I see. Interesting, interesting. So, don't think it would work. You need like ultra, ultra freezers. Ultra freezers, yeah. Ooh. Coming at you with the rice cool bliss. It's, yeah, uh, it says embryo storage here. Embryo f- freezing or embryo cryopreservation is the process of preserving embryos by cooling them to deep sub zero temps, minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. And minus 196 Celsius, that is. Yeah, right, okay. Well, could he not just turn that freezer up on high? It up a notch. Yeah, I was going to say the thing you're forgetting is <laughs> Hammond spared no expense. He's not <laughs> yeah, just got an yeah. Iceland shitty fucking walk in freezer, <laughs> he's got a cold storage freezer just for the ice cream. They're like, John, do we need a, a freezer this good for ice cream? And he, I don't fucking care. <laughs> what do I keep saying? What are we sparing? What are we sparing? What's my catchphrase? What's on the lunchboxes? <laughs> <laughs> they put it together the island to go. The uh, delivery guy goes, oh, I've got this, uh, this industrial cold storage freezer for DNA samples. Is it going in the lab? No, in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> My dear boy, put it in the canteen. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking imbeciles. <laughs> <laughs> 
I love it. That's how he's able to have fucking like eight or nine eight pint tubs of ice cream on the table at once and they're all still frozen. He's just eating them. <laughs> just, just chiseling bits off that. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> he's got he's got a good a good quality brass ice cream chisel. Of course. Spare no expense. He carries it around on that cane. It opens in the middle. <laughs> it's got ice cream chisel. <laughs> Like Splinter's walking stick. Yeah. It's got a little mini fridge with a key on it like that. I just go open my mini fridge here. And there you go. Some luxury chocolates await you. <laughs> right, any further questions? That's no. So I don't think my, my face is going to stand too much more laughing. So, Gaz, I hope your plan is very sensible. <laughs> It's, it's somewhere in the middle. <laughs> the world, Jurassic or no, is not as it seems. The Grand Illusion tells us that this is not the case. Not the case at all. And the Grand Illusion does exist, as it has taken a step beyond concept and become a universal truth. The world is shaped by our perception of it. When we're driving a car, our attentiveness to the road decreases if we illegally decide to take a call on our mobile phone. However... Our attentiveness to the road, our awareness of our surroundings, also decreases when we have a conversation with a passenger seated next to us. Eye glance behaviour is reduced by up to 50% in both scenarios, reducing and altering our perception of the world that we inhabit. We believe that the world is still there, as it was and as it ever will be, but our perception of it has narrowed to the extent that it does not match reality. Hence the grand illusion. If I know anything... It's that Nedry's attention is very much split between driving in driving rain in the pitch black on a dirt track, wiping condensation off his inside windscreen, keeping his chubby little pisshole eyes on a can of shaving foam slush dino embryos. <laughs> his attention is very much divided and his perception of the world is impaired. My contention is that by dividing his attention to such an extent, the brain's executive control that allows Nedry to multitask are in meltdown not allowing our rotund malcontent to see beyond the Dilophosaurus that stands before him after crashing his jeep. Yes, he gets a face full of sticky icky spitty spit, but then he's saved by the same heroic T-Rex as saves our hero characters at the film's close. The Grand Illusion has obfuscated that he slash she had been following Nedry the whole time, watching, waiting to pounce on any dinos that dare attack the precious humans. We don't see Nedry die, nor a body. Therefore, I propose that he escaped and made it to the handoff. No change to his plan is needed, as he already succeeded. What? <laughs> <laughs> you definitely do see the Barbasol can getting buried under loads of mud. Yeah. Maybe uh, maybe the embryos <laughs> fell out into his shirt pocket as it was falling. <laughs> Just a pocket full of embryos. <laughs> That's a good song, that. I like that one. <laughs> That's messed with my mind so much I can't formulate questions. <laughs> I propose that was Gaz's plan all along. Yes, shock and awe, in a way. Yeah. I mean, we do know that the T-Rex encounter that happens to Grant and the kids is happening at the same time Nedry's driving to the docks. Mm -hmm. Is there only one T-Rex? In the first one, yeah. It's two in the second yeah. one. Yeah. Ah, but yeah. I was thinking that, but then, then you, you've got the argument that nature finds a way, life finds a way. But you also got the argument that in the Grand Illusion, we don't know that there aren't 70 T-Rexes on the island, right? Just because we only see one. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. And then I was trying to think, well, yeah, would that happen? And then I thought, well, it's the essence of chaos, so it could. Is this Grand Illusion argument, is this the one that you... You said you were saving for something. No, I'd tell you what that was, which, because uh, you, you mentioned it a few weeks now, that was going to be to do a song which uh, Lord Manly Supreme has well and truly blown out of the water. So uh, that, that's not yeah. happening. <laughs> 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 he did to win the old fucking first season. <laughs> Bitter. You shit bag. <laughs> <laughs> right, any uh, further questions? Do you think, rather than try and fish his car out when the when the T-Rex attacks, Gaz, do you think he would be better off running? I don't know how far away from the East Docks he is at that point. My thought was, when the T-Rex saves him, that it would flip him up onto its head, right? 
turn around and you know at the start of the Flintstones <laughs> when Fred slides down and like <laughs> his tail flips it. Go. That's what would happen. It'd flip him the rest of the way off its tail. Yeah, it sounds plausible. <laughs> <laughs> So in summary, we had Lord Manly Supreme plan, which involved toilet breaks, a loo roll suit, and a charming skyhook made out of fence wire to rescue him from the, the island. Craig said he'd hide his embryos in ice cream, call the ice cream a dreadful name, bury it at the bottom of the freezer, and we're going to, I think we'll probably let him use a cold storage freezer for the ice cream f- freezer. I think we all said that's probably all right. And Gaz told us our perception is wrong and that Dennis Nedry did actually escape, <laughs> which I think is the easiest way to Just sum do it that up. every week. <laughs> <laughs> week by week, Gaz's directorial hand-waving has just grown more fucking ballsy. <laughs> shoo, 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 shoo. <laughs> so. You didn't summarise your own plan. Oh, mine, yeah, sorry. Uh, I can't even remember what my plan was. <laughs> <laughs> Memorable. <laughs> I, can't, I can't fucking... Yeah, um... It was a dry white map, basically. Oh, yeah, sorry. And my plan, of course, was to have a laminated map and surplus equipment to make sure that Nedry's trip down to dock and back was foolproof. And that is that. So there can only be one winner or two. Or more. Or four, but not three. Maybe. Never three. <laughs> Never three. three. <laughs> Never three. <laughs> so, uh, can we please have your votes? We will go with Lord Manly Supreme first. I'm voting for the plan that's probably the most simplest and realistic to execute, which was Adam's plan with the dry wipe map. Craig. Well, despite what I pointed to as a huge hole, I think, you know, the explanation was... Fair enough, and therefore I voted for Lord Mainly and the Supremes. <laughs> With uh, some nice calligraphy. Yeah. <laughs> did you do that now? Did you have it prepared? No, I just did that now. <laughs> Jesus. That is nice. Pleasant. Gaz. I also voted for Adam's dry wipe map plan. And uh, I particularly like Craig's plan. Ooh. Especially as it evolved into um, pure hilarity. Oh, so Turner takes it with two votes. Turner takes it. Yeah, one point. Home vantage. Gaz, can you please tell us how that affects the scores on the board? Well, still sitting in joint first place are myself, Gaz and Craig with seven and a half points each. In second place, with four and a half points, is Adam. Yes! And bringing up the rear, with three and a half points, is Lord Manly Supreme. In the rear, with the gear. I was robbed again this week. Absolutely robbed. <laughs> you got to stop doing this uh, tactical come down with me voting. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, as I won this week, I will not pick the film for next week. That is up to Lord Manly Supreme. I think I've mentioned this film a few times over the course of the podcast. I think it's high time we dive into it. We are going to be watching Labyrinth. Oh, Oh, finally. Finally. So get on your finest cod pieces, spruce up your (laughs) hair, and let's get into it. (laughs) And that brings us to the end of this week's episode. Thank you for listening, and I hope you've enjoyed yourselves as much as we have. If you have, please leave us a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts from. And don't forget to follow us so that you never miss an episode. Why not share us with a friend, an acquaintance, or even a colleague, and follow us across social media on at DiabolicalPod to show all your other friends how cool you are. So until next time, dear listener, just think of it kind of like a big cow.
think of the podcast like a big cow, giving you the milk of comedy from our ample teats. <laughs> Come get your sustenance, boys. <laughs> Jurassic Park is frightening in the dark. All the animals are running wild. Not in Ferrero. Yeah, yeah. Was he the inventor of the Rocher? Oh, I hope he was. Yes, he was, yeah. It says here Martin Ferrero is an American actor and chocolatier. <laughs> There's a smiley face in the D in mine. Like, oh, yeah. Almost as good as Craig's. Is that like a little alien with uh, eyes on top of his head? Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, the, you know, there were the, the times we'd try and ride a, a bathtub down the hill. <laughs> <laughs> we did three jackets with elbow patches yeah. on. <laughs> was, it, was it you turn up? I kept going into that charity shop because you were after the, uh, after the woman that worked in there. She had baggy tights that kept, that kept uh, <laughs> piling up around her ankles. <laughs> Nora. <laughs> Used to carry a rolling pin. I'm just remembering my childhood. Did she work? Didn't she used to work in the um, local calf though? Not the selling scones and that. That was her. Yeah. God bless you. <laughs> <laughs>